The festival was held in a one-room bar called the Cozy Cove, which had no sign. The bar had a rich history, but it seemed to have lost its way. We were greeted by the owner, Jerry. As we pulled up, they were putting our names out the front. Also playing was Ryan. And the third generation bluegrass band. They had a massive tour bus. I think they'd been conned by Jerry into playing for the whole week. There were lots of members of the band, mostly young guys, who seemed to have been plucked from their families to tour the country in a bus under the irresponsible eye of their leader. I think his name was Mark. We called him Big Daddy. We each had a hundred dollar tab at the bar and beer was dollar a can. Charlie was introduced by Jerry as the great Charlie Parr. The name stuck and Charlie was not happy. Charlie captivated the few remaining people and Jerry gradually turned off almost all the lights until we were nearly sitting in the dark. After the show, people wanted to go swimming in the lake. Jerry led a mixed crowd through the woods and down to the waterside. Along with me and Nat, there was Casey the barmaid and her boyfriend, also a delinquent kid who also worked at the bar, and the Texan banjo player from the bluegrass outfit. People took off whatever clothes they felt comfortable in. I went in my underpants, Nat rolled up her trousers, Jerry went naked. Wet and drawn in by the porch light, we wandered back to our cabin, where Tom Cops and Charlie were still up drinking. Jerry disappeared and the kid raided the bar for a bottle of rum and more beers. Texas told us about his girlfriend. Everyone drank rum and we raced about on big spools. Sadie Jones, everybody knows this as well as girl in town. Texas finished the rum. Texas started crying. As a child, he had witnessed things that no one should. And the more he drank, the more it came out. Surprising things. Things that would take years of therapy. Something he wasn't going to get on that bus. The kid started crying too. Casey passed out, then woke up and chased Nat down the road. It was suddenly light, and the unused outdoor stage seemed to be the best place to sleep. We all woke up with sweaty heads and dry mouths. Texas's puke had dried out on the floor of the cabin. Later on, we sat around playing by the van. Charlie played with Daniel, the violinist from the bluegrass unit. A nervous woman called Shay came and sang a song. afternoon drifted by. Suddenly, this tranquil scene received the presence of an incongruous girl dressed in a very small, almost see-through dress and thigh-length boots. Big Daddy waddled over to show off his new toy. Apparently, her name was Hootie. Hootie went off for a tour of the van. Daniel slunk off to join them. The rest of us felt a bit sick. This is the only image we have of Hooty. That night, it was the same again. From us, Charlie, and the Bluegrass Boys. 
The next morning, we left as soon as possible, saying our goodbyes to Jerry, Casey, the Bluegrass Dudes, and Hootie. We drove to Duluth, a beautiful town by Lake Superior, where Charlie lives. We were met by Elijah. <laughs> we also met Emily, Charlie's wife, and Tallulah. We played at the brew house in the evening, which is Charlie's regular Wednesday night show. It's a pretty small place with a tiny stage, but a wild atmosphere. Charlie played and was joined by Lane. All the ladies love Lane, a handsome rogue on a prolonged bender. Lots of them had been trying to save him, and he just couldn't help himself. In the end, Lane started screaming for everyone to go to the lake and have a swim. But we eventually got away without another lakeside adventure. We spent three days in Duluth, and it gave us time to unwind and hang out with Charlie and his family. Charlie is known around town, but people stop him in hardware stores and places to talk about his music. This seems to embarrass him. We played in Superior on the Thursday. With lots of dancing. And the following night, we played at Pizza Luce with the Get Up Johns. And Devil's Flying Machine, Charlie's other band. Charlie says it's all boom, boom, boom that gets the audience wild. It doesn't really matter if it's in tune. The Kitty Cat Club is in Minneapolis, an amazing place. It had an old photo booth where we got carried away. We had a weird interview with an internet radio station. We do hear in the background Mr. Charlie Parr on the on yep. the stage, and you're currently on tour with him, as you said. How has this been going? I feel like it's changed us. Charlie is a serious, that's his job, what he's doing out there now. You know, both of us have got other ways of supplementing our income, and he's been doing it like this for three years. He's got a good work ethic. After the show, we drove to Charlie's mum's house in Austin, Minnesota, home of Spam. Charlie's mum worked at the Spam factory since the 40s and is now an official Spam ambassador. She is very knowledgeable about Spam. Between the two plants, they do 44,000 cans an hour. This is George Hormel here. He's the founder of the company in 1891. There's the Spam Spamettes. <laughs> You'll see them in the movie. They sing only spam songs. They're very wow. cute. These are honey. These are the ones I wanted you to taste. What one have you got? I got the honey one. Okay. The hang. We've been gone to the spam museum today. So left and we went to a movie. Everything's, everything's excited. After all that spam, we headed to Winona a small town on the Mississippi, where Emily's parents live. Hello? 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 Hi. How are you doing? Winona, 